Schönen guten Abend. So, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, der Doug Sanders, herzlich willkommen in die Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Welcome to Germany, welcome to Berlin and welcome to Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Ich möchte Sie alle im Namen der Heinrich Böll Stiftung und unseres Berliner Bildungswerks herzlich begrüßen. Wir freuen uns, dass Sie alle heute da sind. Im Rahmen des Verbundprojektes der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung Hochinklusiv waren wir in den vergangenen Wochen und Monaten an einer Reihe von Projekten und Veranstaltungen beteiligt, die sich mit den Gefahren des äh, sozialen Ausschlusses, äh, aber auch Möglichkeiten des gesellschaftlichen Zusammenhalts auseinandersetzen. Und genau in dieser Linie passt unsere heutige Veranstaltung und freuen uns sehr, mit Doc Saunders und mit Ihnen heute über Stadt, Migration und Teilhabe diskutieren zu können. Genau vor zwei Wochen saßen wir in diesem Raum im Kreis einiger europäischer Fachleute und diskutierten über den Zusammenhang von Raum, ökonomische Perspektiven und politische Partizipation, also Urban Citizenship, in Städten. Ich freue mich, dass wir heute in einem breiteren und globalen Kontext mit Doug Saunders darüber diskutieren können. Über Jahrhunderte haben Mobilität die Entwicklung von Städten weltweit als Zentren von Wirtschaft, Kultur und Politik massiv beeinflusst. Der Bericht der United Nations Population Fund von 2007 fand heraus, dass zum ersten Mal in der menschlichen Geschichte mehr als die Hälfte der Weltbevölkerung in städtischen Räumen lebt. Für viele bedeutet das urbane Leben Aufstieg und Erfolg, aber für viele Millionen Menschen geht es ums nackte Überleben. In gleichem Maße sind auch Städte von der zugestiegenen Mobilität betroffen. Eine Herausforderung, die von der rasanten Urbanisierung hervorgeht. Migration bringt zweifelsohne ökonomische, soziale und kulturelle Möglichkeiten mit sich. Gleichzeitig durchlaufen Städte aber auch enorme räumliche soziokulturelle und ökonomische Transformationsprozesse. Für neue Migrantinnen und Migranten, gemeint sind auch Menschen, die innerhalb eines Landes auch von ländlichen Räumen in urbane Räume umsiedeln, bedeuten, bedeuten die Städte oft Chancen. Chancen, weil sie neue Perspektiven auf Bildung, Arbeit, individuelle Freiheit und Aufstiegsmöglichkeiten bieten. Oft sind sie aber auch harte Pflaster, verlorene soziale und familiäre Bindungen, Anonymität und Isolation können Menschen in der Stadt in das soziale, psychische und ökonomische Elend stürzen. Neue Ankömmlinge starten ihr urbanes Leben und damit auch die Zukunft, häufig in Stadtteilen oder Außenbezirken, die von der Mittelschicht ver verlassen, von der Politik vernachlässigt worden sind. Sie gehören zu den heruntergekommenen und marginalisierten Orten der Stadt. Vor allem Migrantinnen und Migranten starten dort ein komplett neues Leben. Doc Saunders hat in seinem Buch Arrival City genau solche Orte weltweit besucht und genau beobachtet, Schicksale von Menschen verfolgt und über sie geschrieben. Deshalb werde ich genau an dieser Stelle meinen Mund halten und das Wort an ihn geben. Bevor ich das tue, möchte ich selbstverständlich unseren heutigen Gast kurz vorstellen. Doc Saunders ist Journalist und arbeitet seit 1995 für die kanadische Zeit The Globe and the Mail, The Globe and Mail, er leitet das in London stationierte Europabüro von The Globe. Davor war er Reporter in Los Angeles. Seine Themenschwerpunkte sind Europapolitik, internationale Politik sowie Sozialpolitik. Darüber hinaus beschäftigt er sich ausführlich mit dem Nahen Osten, Russland und dem indischen Subkontinent. Geboren in Hamilton, Ontario und aufgewachsen in Toronto, hat Doc Saunders für seine journalistischen Tätigkeiten mehrere Preise erhalten. Seine aktuellsten und weltweit bekannten Bücher sind Rival City, welches letztes Jahr erschienen ist, ähm, hat, wurde in Kanada mit einem hochdotierten Preis, Donner Prize, ausgezeichnet. Für Rival City bereiste Doc Saunders innerhalb von drei Jahren 20 Städte auf fünf Kontinenten und untersuchte, wie Städte Neuankömmlinge aufnehmen und welche Chancen sie ihnen geben, ihre Zukunft zu gestalten. Sein zweites Buch hat den Originaltitel Titel The Myth of the Muslim Tide, auf Deutsch Mythos Überfremdung, wurde vor kurzem erschienen. Darin schildert und enttarnt 
Doc Saunders in einem historischen Kontext wie politische Agitatoren in der Vergangenheit und heute mit Hilfe pseudowissenschaftlicher Erkenntnisse Unsicherheit und Feindseligkeit in multikulturellen Gesellschaften verbreiten. Ich wünsche Ihnen viel Spaß. Doc Saunders, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for coming out tonight uh, to hear this. I'm very pleased to see so many people have come. And thank you to the Heinrich Boll uh, Ziftung for organizing this and, and uh, making this trip possible. My, my overarching subject tonight is the pathway that leads from the mud floor to the middle class. Um, something like a fifth of the world's population are essentially living on mud floors now in, in subsistence level <laughs> rural areas in, as peasants. Uh, and a billion of them in, in considerable poverty. But this is changing very quickly. The last 20 years have seen the largest shift in human populations, both out of poverty and out of, out of subsistence rural living in history. And right now we are in the midst of a shift that is uh, doing to the southern and eastern three quarters of the world what happened to Europe during the time between about the French Revolution and, and the, the two world wars. That is a shift from a majority subsistence population to a strong majority urban population, which tends to stabilize things when that happens. I'm going to be taking you through with photos some of the places that I visit in, in a rival city um, in order to illustrate some of these ideas. And I'll briefly be visiting some cities in Europe to talk about this new book, uh, Mythos Uber Fremdung, or The Myth of the Muslim Tide, which is secretly an, almost an appendix to a rival city, dealing with the specific case of religious minority immigrants and the way that they urbanize through, uh, through urban neighborhoods. Because this is a topic of some controversy in Europe and North America, and uh, I thought that my approach of analyzing the way integration works or fails might be more useful than some of the ideological approaches and so on. Anyway, to begin, let's start on the mud floor. Um, this is the Hay family, who live in a village uh, near the center of Sichuan in China. Um, they, they definitely live on less than a dollar a day. They're a fairly typical Chinese rice farming family. Um, and uh, they live very close to the land. You have to walk down a very long length of mud pathways to get to their house. And they, they use, you know, basically live very close to nature. They grow what they can just to survive. During periods in previous generations, the failure of crop has led to the deaths of members of families and things like that. That's the reality for that part of the world. However, if you go a few houses down the laneway, you find a house that's largely abandoned, and the people who used to live there are now here. This is the Jean family from the same place. They, 15 years ago, were living in pretty much the same sort of conditions. Now they own a, this condominium apartment in, uh, in Chongqing, the gigantic city in the middle of China, and they actually have a share in the building. Their family income is about 15,000 US dollars per year, which not only makes them middle class in China, but makes them actually quite well up in the middle class. Um, they have the type of lifestyle that most of us would recognize. N now, I have to say that my travels do not take me into a lot of people who have gone from a mud floor to a lifestyle like this within one generation. And in fact, even within two generations, that's still fairly rare around the world. Uh, I had to seek out these people, uh, or I'd heard about them as a special case. And one of the questions we should have is why it takes so long. Why when, so, when uh, the alleviation of poverty is happening so quickly in the developing world and social mobility is theoretically fairly high, is it actually so difficult to make it beyond the point of simply moving from starvation level poverty to non-starvation level poverty and so on. Regardless, whether people make it through in a generation uh, or they simply make it into slightly better than rural life, uh, how do they get there? This family certainly did not move from that mud floor village into this condominium. They spent most of the last 15 years in this place, which is in 
on the, it was on the outskirts of Chongqing. It's now sort of three, a quarter of the way into Chongqing because the city's exploded so much. This is in a neighborhood called Liu Gongli. Um, it, in the early 1990s, was a, a farming village with about 70 people living in it um, until they decided to let it be developed uh, or to actually exploit it themselves as the city expanded. And now it's part of a cluster of officially non-existent, self-built houses and factories that contain about 200,000 people. Um, none of the houses officially exist, none of the factories officially exist, none of the businesses officially exist, and all 200,000 people are officially villagers who live far away in rural areas in, in other provinces and so on, because China does not allow you to register your citizenship in a city when you move. Inside this neighborhood, you see a, a huge amount of business and, and industry and activity going on. Um, and what's happening there is groups of people from specific villages have set up housing close to each other, have set up factories that employ each other and so on, and have bought their property, not legally, but on the informal market, and are using the rise in value of it to borrow money on the informal market and finance their businesses and so on, um, much as middle class people do in many countries. And uh, it's what I call an arrival city. At the, this is the lowest level, you could say. But this, the, the internal structure is the same, which is that if there's a network of people from the same villages who, who mutually support one, each other, one another, govern one, each, one another, loan each other money, uh, and who use the income from there to send money back to the village, which is the main source of income in the village. I mean, as of 2005, the largest source of rural income in China became money sent from relatives in the city. That's now larger than all the agricultural output of China. And that's true in many developing countries now. Uh, and they also use the money to try to link themselves and link their children into the established economy and educational system of, uh, of Chongqing and into the housing networks and political system. So an arrival city is an urban area of land, an urban neighborhood with cheap housing that serves as a machine as that, that uh, creates social mobility. That's the intention of the people who move there. Um, and the people who move there usually have schemes to do it, but when it gets blocked, something can go wrong. Now, I promise you this is the only graph I'm going to show you in this presentation. I prefer photographs. Just to tell you what the underlying phenomenon it is that we're talking about. This is a map of the level of urbanization of the world, starting in 1950, right after the war, going to 2050. We, our present moment is right along the middle here. These lines at the top are Europe and North America, which have been largely fully urbanized, 70% or so. Uh, th throughout this period. We, we, our level of urbanization has been the same since the middle of the 20th century, largely. Here we, Europe seems to be increasing a bit over this period because this includes, uh, this includes I believe, Europe right up to the Urals. Uh, this is South and Central America, however, here, which started off being 60% peasant farmers after the Second World War, and then during the last 60 years has urbanized very quickly to the point that South and Central America are now as urban as North America and Europe. And this helps explain very much why this period in here was a period of intense political turmoil, of weekly stories about coups and revolutions and violence and so on, because a lot of both the revolutionary and counter-revolutionary violence in South and Central America during those decades involved involved battles over the urbanizing population and their needs and so on. I would argue that the military dictatorships in several com countries were responses to that. And the reason why we've had, we had a decade of largely democratic stability in most countries in here was because that process was complete. Um, however, here we have Africa and Asia, which started out being extremely rural, now are kind of halfway there. And, uh, and are, are, in other words, halfway through this enormous uh, shift of, of population. How do populations like that shift? Um, what does it mean for them, for them to shift? And what are the consequences of that? Just briefly to describe a couple of the larger macro consequences of this phenomenon and why this is important to worry about beyond just human conditions is that when this happens, 
a couple, a couple things occur that have great importance for the ecological future of the Earth, you could say. One of which is that whenever a family shifts from this end, from the rural end to the urban end of the spectrum, the number of children they have everywhere decreases dramatically. I mean, um, a typical case would be Iran, Iran, which went from having seven children per family in the 1980s to having 1.7 children per family now, less than France, and therefore has a shrinking population at this point, or close to, close to shrinking population. Um, similar really dramatic transitions have occurred in Turkey, Lebanon, United Arab Emirates, Bangladesh, and so on, which are all now approaching European family size levels, and as a result, going from fast growing populations to stable and then shrinking ones. The success of urbanization will determine the point at which the Earth's human population will peak and start declining, and so on. Right now, the best projections from the United Nations Population Division have the world's population peaking in the last couple decades of this century at something more than 9 billion. Um, there are only about 17 countries in the world that are driving all the world's population growth at the moment. And if things could be done politically to make agricultural modernization happen in those countries, urban management happen better so that people uh, have reasons to urbanize voluntarily, you never want to force people, then we could shift that peak to uh, several years earlier to say peak, the world population peaking in the year 2050 at uh, eight and a half billion or something like that. It makes a huge difference as far as the consumption of resources in the future and so on, how this happens. And a lot of this depends on how these neighborhoods I'm talking about, the arrival city neighborhoods are managed. The second consequence is on the rural level. Um, when guys like this, I met these guys in northern Bangladesh, in Silet, uh, do farming this way, they don't produce an awful lot of food per hectare. They're usually growing for their own survival and so on. And when you have a lot of people living in the rural areas, you don't produce a lot of food. When Europe had three quarters of its population living in villages like this, starvation and malnutrition were very common phenomena, food shortages and the ensuing riots were a major factor and so on. Only when Europe got down to less than 20% of the population in rural areas did Europe start to produce more food than it consumed. And just to, to give you a sense of that difference, I mean, Canada, where I was born, has 2% of its population employed in agriculture, and it produces several times more food than, it, than its 30 million people can consume and exports enough food to feed, if it wanted to, all of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, which has three quarters of its population employed in agriculture, can, produces only a fraction of the food its 150 million people need and is a net importer of food and so on. So the urgency of this is important. We have huge areas in the Indian subcontinent and sub-Saharan Africa that could be producing much, much more for food they, than they do, but instead they're supporting human populations. And uh, so when this transition occurs that I'm describing, agriculture goes from something that supports people on the land to something that produces food. It's very important. So how do people make this transition? I had thought when I started working on Arrival City that one of my chapters would begin with a family somewhere in the developing world on the week that they decided to load all their possessions onto a train or a bus or something and move to the city. I thought if there are 30 million new city dwellers created every month around the world, it should be pretty easy to find someone like that somewhere. And after several years of research, I, I finally dawned on me that this never happens. Anywhere in the world throughout history, nobody's ever just gone from a subsistence village and loaded their possessions onto a train and moved to a city. What happens is, first in a farm, farming family, one person, you think of it as being male, although it's in, this is increasingly a female role, moves to the city for a season in between, in between harvests to earn a little bit of extra income, usually using connections they've got to other villagers from the same area. They might share a room with 12 other people. In warmer climates like this, they might sleep on the street. Uh, and they will send back what in the city is a tiny amount of money, what in the village is probably an amount of money larger than all of their agricultural earnings. And after a while, maybe they'll bring another relative over. They might stay all year round after a while, and then someone else, and then maybe they'll rent a room of their own, 
Maybe they'll look at setting up a little shop or something, or uh, even purchasing a piece of informal housing or something. And at some point, after maybe five years, maybe 20 years, maybe a generation or two generations, the family will realize, well, we're no longer a peasant farming family with getting some extra income from the city. We're now an urban family using the village as a place to keep the old people and send the children to school and that sort of thing. And maybe then they'll, they'll pick up stakes. But I know, I know former peasant farmers living in London and Toronto who've, who've been there for 60 years who still keep you know, some tie to their original village. We don't expect it to end quickly. It's a reason why um, in migration, um, insisting on one citizenship is often not the wisest idea. So people, these, the people make the move. Who are the people who get on these ships from that, from that peasant village uh, down the river to Dhaka, Bangladesh, in this case? Who are these, who are these lone male laborers? The image we tend to have is that they are failed, very poor, desperate people falling out of rural life and landing in, in desperation in the city and so on. In fact, they tend to be the people from the village who are most ambitious, who've saved up money because it's, it's not cheap or easy to do this, who, uh, who are taking the largest risks in order to do this because it's a very risky thing uh, and so on. It tends to be the, the most uh, ambitious and, and I would say about half of all villagers who move to arrival city slums in the developing world end up moving back because they can't take it for various reasons. So what you're left with is the toughest of the toughest. Not necessarily the nicest of the nicest or anything, but, but a very resilient group of people. Um, let's go to one of these places. This is in the center of Dhaka, the fastest growing city in the world. On the left here is Gulshan, which is um, the high-rise neighborhood where most of the well-off middle class people live, the people whose lives that we would recognize from our own. And across this smelly lagoon, on the right here, is a piece of land that uh, in the early 1990s was, was uh, an empty piece of swamp land that belonged to the city's electrical utility that people began to squat on in shacks. And at this point has maybe somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people living on it. It's called Corral. Um, and again, it officially does not exist. And Looking down from those high-rise apartments, it looks like a place of the fallen, the destitute. The people in the apartments describe it as a cancer that has grown on their city, and they're constantly agitating to have it bulldozed and removed. But in fact, they're unaware that the people who live there are providing their childcare, they're driving their cars, they're cleaning their clothes, they're providing their prostitution, they're providing sort of the whole range of services for them. And who are the people who are crossing into this extremely unpleasant looking place? Um, a lot of them have lived in other slums that look to our eyes like better slums and are coming here. They're choosing to come into this place over others. Why is that? Partly because Corral is located right next to these high-rise apartments that provide employment, right next to garment factories that provide employment and, and places that provide consumer markets for your shops and so on. But also because the tin shacks here can be purchased, um, unlike in the other slums where they, where they tend to be rented from dodgy characters who rent them. Here you can buy them from the dodgy characters who, uh, who squatted them. Um, and you do certainly do not have a, a legal land title that would be recognized by any level of government or by, by the tax department. But you have a piece of paper from the guy who controls it that says you own it. And, and again, you can borrow money from informal money lenders to do what you want, to, to start a small business if you want, or, or get into a lot of debt if, you, if that's all you want, and so on. Um, and so as, as you move through the laneways of Corral, and you get toward the center, you start noticing infrastructure. Uh, not city provided, there's no presence of government here at all. There's some NGOs who've drilled wells and that sort of thing, but uh, uh, the gov government has no presence except when the police raid the place and when there's an election. Um, but there's water utility tapped into the water main by entrepreneurial people who've uh, used rubber garden hoses to sell water connections to the people who live here. There's electricity, as there is in most slums, tapped in illegally from the lines. And the first utility to arrive in most slums in the Indian subcontinent and South America and a few other places, often decades before there's a toilet, is the cable television. Um, and the cable television guy in the slums of, of the Indian subcontinent is a very powerful figure. He's the chief statistician, the person who keeps a record book of who lives there because they have to pay him, uh, and who knows where people are from, often linked into the organized crime gangs and political parties that control things there and so on. 
And you, when I started out, I often wondered why so many extremely poor people living on maybe a family income of three or four dollars a day are paying three dollars a month for a package of of, uh, of 30 television channels for their tiny little TV. And partly it's an educational purpose, I think. Partly it's because life there is pretty tedious and, and you do want something to do when you're sitting in your shack and you finish your job. But I, I think also to, to a large extent, based on talking to people, it's what I'd call an aspirational purchase. The people who live there have an idea that although the cable TV bill is a large part of their monthly income, they are going to be the sort of people for whom it's not a large part of the family income. No, none of them expect to get rich, but all of them expect to have sort of, or at least their children, some sort of stable living that would make cable TV an irrelevance. Many of them are tragically wrong, but, uh, but it's, an, it's, it's almost laying down a token on your future expectations of yourself. And a lot of the small businesses, once you get through those laneways into the larger mud laneway in the middle of this slum, you see a lot of businesses, a lot of video rental businesses, none of which I think are, uh, recognized by the International Copyright Convention. Um, a lot of food preparation businesses, these are people who are working 10 hours a day at a garment mill or something like that. Uh, convenience food is important, and it being Bangladesh, the, the food is often really excellent. And, uh, and video arcades, I was surprised by that at first. Uh, and uh, until I realized that the video arcades are essentially another substitute for the missing state. They are de facto child care centers. Parents send their kids to them all day while they work, uh, and so on. And there are a lot of these de facto, not quite great substitutes for things that the state should be providing, um, including substitutes for medical things that aren't very nice, and so on. Photo studios, which again, not realistic photos, but oriental fantasies to, uh, uh, again, aspirational. Class, various types of informal schooling provided by people for a fee inside the slum to each other. Um, uh, here you can see they're learning English uh, as well as Bengali. Uh, English is very popular there. Why would it be popular? Um, partly because one of the few really, really good jobs that people looked up to as call center worker, acting as if you're the Holiday Inn uh, you know, front desk clerk for Americans or something like uh, that, and, or the person servicing your software, and, uh, and also for those aspirational reasons I mentioned. There are garment factories inside this arrival city, none of them officially existing, uh, usually provided by slum dwellers who themselves were workers in other garment factories and maybe borrowed a little bit of money teamed up with other people, bought a few sewing machines, are running their own little garment mills that undercut the already low Bangladeshi minimum wage. Um, and there's a huge metalworking district, woodworking district inside there, so there's a good amount of stuff. The Chinese slum I showed you at the beginning has like gigantic things where, where the slum dwellers have bought 20 or 30 computerized milling machines that are making motorcycle parts and so on. So it's not always rudimentary industry going on. Um, and this, it's not always a, a success story. In fact, I'm not, I don't want to create the perception that this is some sort of, you know, Adam Smith miracle of, uh, of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurial success for everybody. Uh, I mean, it's sort of halfway between there, there and the sort of a Friedrich Engels vision of Manchester in 1848 or something like that. This is Maxuda Begum, one of the many people I met for whom things had gone terribly wrong. She arrived a couple years before with her husband. They had been sent from their village to make some income. Um, a lot of people had hopes on them. And her husband got a job working as a uh, bicycle rickshaw driver. One of the, it's the main means of public transportation in Dhaka. It's a terrible job. I mean, it kills people a lot. Uh, it's subject to physical destruction and drug addiction and so on. And, um, and he died, as many of them do. And, and she was just stuck with the problem. She had her six-year-old child and she had to work 10 hours a day, and she could eat, she certainly had no schooling or childcare of any sort, so she could either give up and go back to the village and let down her, her whole village, or she could put her child, her only friend in the world, up for adoption, essentially, at a school where she can visit once a month, which is what she did. She cries herself to sleep every night, missing her child, but she's stuck there, she has nothing to do. Uh, and is just barely holding on, able to send the money back to the village. Is her case the majority there? It may well be. I mean, the, the lack of the state there, the lack of development means that people who come in here are taking huge personal risks, risks can, that can, can deliver great, great promise, but that can also 
fail very, very, very badly. Let's then ask the question of what happens when these places go wrong and how to turn them around. This is, uh, this is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This is one of the many uh, favelas uh, that climb up and down the mountaintops there. And they're, they are sort of, if you've seen any movies about them, you'll know they're, they're a classic example of a city that's gone horribly wrong, or at least until quite recently they were. They were formed between the 1960s and the 1990s as people from the rural, very poor northeast of Brazil moved into the large cities of Brazil and built their own housing. It was never recognized by the, any, any type of government, uh, and Brazil essentially went to war over these places for a while. Um, Various governments tried various attempts to stop people from migrating to the city, which actually produced an increase in people moving to the city, although they, they, they then move even more illegally and live even more underground. And various attempts to try to shut down these places. There is certainly never any attempt to govern them or to recognize them as citizens of the city. As a result, people found a de facto way to self-govern, which was to have the cocaine trafficking gangs, the traficantes, run the place or at least they, they just came in and ran the place. They serve as a de facto municipal government. They, um, they provide you security, they regulate the place, but they also, if you want to buy a, a gas cylinder for your cooking stove, you buy it from the traficantes who control your neighborhood at four times the retail rate. If you go into the city and buy it at a normal price, they might shoot your mother. So it's, it's not a good life and it means that, that if the people here do any of the normal immigrant, rural to urban migrant things and start to form a small business or something, they're not getting any customers from the city coming in, and as well as all the physical problems of these places. Brazil, and these, these are people living very close together, very tight-knit communities, uh, started out very ambitious, but the, these places become violent and depressed and troubled. A lot of people felt they were stuck that way intergenerationally, but there have been some Important Brazilian efforts. Brazil is one of those countries, along with, uh, along with Peru and Colombia and the Philippines, that have been able to take failed, what I'm calling a rival city neighborhoods, and turn them around. This is, uh, this is over in, in Sao Paulo, the other great city of Brazil. This neighborhood here uh, in the mid-1990s was described by a UN agency as the single most violent place on earth, with a murder rate that exceeded many of the war zones. Um, and a number of things happened there, which I won't get into now. I described them in a rival city to turn it around. Partly self-government from the people there, partly uh, self-policing. But one of the most important things was that a very enlightened municipal government in Sao Paulo realized that one of the problems of the favelas in that city, in, in, in Rio, the problem is they go up and down the side of a sheer cliff. In Sao Paulo, the problem is they're often very far from the center of the city, on, on the edge of a lake or something like that. And it means that if you get a job, you know, cleaning in the city or something, it's a, it would have been a two-hour trip into the city and a two-hour trip back, and your children are left with the, the streets here as their main source of child care, and no surprise that they form, join a gang or something like that. If you wanted to open an ice cream shop over here, there's no chance you would get anyone from the city to shop in it because of the two-hour trip. And in Sao Paulo, they discovered that simply putting in a regular bus service four times an hour could really have a dramatic effect in transforming these neighborhoods. Another thing they did was they put in street lighting up here, which more, th more than other things, I would cynically argue more than toilets, can transform uh, a neighborhood. Um, both making the streets safe that people can move around in them, but making them also seem prosperous so your housing is worth more. Remember, these people tend to own their favela housing. And, uh, um, and therefore, they, they want to say there. It had a transformative effect. Back down in, in Rio, a more dramatic sort of intervention is being done in many of these favelas. They've, various organizations like the World Bank tried things in the 1970s in the developing countries to improve slums, to what they called upgrading. Um, and and uh, so these were often successful physically. They, made, they added a toilet or something, and it looked nice. But they discovered one of the problems with, with this was that as soon as you put in a toilet, it, it raises the property value of, of the slum housing, 
uh, to the point that it no longer is a place that very poor people can afford to live in, and so on. Um, and it, tend, it, it creates some distorting effects, and so on. And the Brazilians are doing one of the several solutions. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways around these problems, because they sort of gave up after a while in the 70s. But what they do in Brazil is, is a complete intervention, one of which is to control who, basically to say whoever's living there now are now the official residents, because you've mostly been living there for 40 years. And let's freeze this place in place and make it an upwardly mobile neighborhood rather than a slum neighborhood. And what they do is, yes, they install plumbing and electricity, they rebuild the foundations of houses, but they also, and they put in transportation links to get pe people, and more importantly, customers up the side of the cliff. I'd say Brazil is one of the only developing countries that could afford this type of infrastructure on a large scale level. Uh, but also, they bring in cartographers, statisticians, uh, census takers, and so on. They, they give everybody a legal ownership deed on their, on, on their slum shack, turn it into a formal house, and they give everybody a street address, so that, which means that they can get a legal job in the city and receive a paycheck by mail. Uh, it also means they can pay their ta taxes and their electrical bills and so on, which is less popular, but, but also important in its way. And, and it makes it easier to start a business in there and so on. It delineates the area, and it means that those who live there don't feel that they're a constant encampment. Brazil can do this because it's largely 100%, it's as urbanized as it's going to get now. There are not hundreds of thousands of people moving in from the villages to the cities anymore. So they can stabilize these places and transform them. But what they do is they say, rather than sending in the police like they used to do, or that's just sending in someone to install toilets like they used to do, they, they bring in all levels of government into this previously ungoverned space at once, as well as kicking out the drug gangs. Uh, and uh, it's a bold experiment, one of several going on around the world that are worth considering. Oh yes, and they bring in Wi-Fi, um, which is happening anyway. The, in the Brazilian favelas, by one study uh, in Sao Paulo, the rate of internet penetration is about 25%. That is 25% of households at this point have access to some form of, of internet and so on. It's increasingly something that not the rural poor so much, who really don't have any money to buy anything, but the urban uh, arrival city poor are using uh, to communicate, to communicate with, their, their, with the farm village they came from, to communicate with job prospects, also education. You see a lot of Indian families who, you know, their oldest child is learning JavaScript programming in a, in a battered old computer in the back of, of their hut, and so on. Uh, the awareness that an information technology type of education, even at a rudimentary level, can provide you this, the economic security you need in the future is very important to people. Um, let me shift for a moment to a different arrival city. Um, this looks not at all like the previous ones I've just showed you, but inside contains very much the same social and economic structure because a good part of immigration to Europe and North America is driven as a consequence of that large-scale urbanization taking place in the developing world. I don't want to mislead people into thinking that's the biggest thing. I mean, immigration from uh, other parts of Europe is the main immigration in Europe and so on. But the, the people who come from the, the largest, some of the largest international immigration flows in the, in the developed world are from not from one country to another, but from villages in one place to urban neighborhoods in another country. Um, the, Polish, the million Polish people who moved to Britain and Ireland during the, last, uh, during the years after they joined the European Union, they, it was not Poland moving to Britain. It was people from a select few villages in Silesia and around Gdansk and so on, moving to specific urban neighborhoods in North London and East London and so on. Um, the Turks who move to Europe do not uh, generally come from the large cities of Turkey. They come from Anatolia and from the, the villages of the southeast and east. The Moroccans tend to come from the, the reef mountains. Um, the South Los Angeles, you can map each city block practically to specific clusters of villages in Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras and track the, their special banks that provide mortgage loans pr in the currencies of those countries in those neighborhoods of Los Angeles so that they can finance house purchases and so on. So universally, internationally, 
Countries do not immigrate to other countries. Specific clusters of villages migrate to specific sections of, of cities. It's why disrupting some of these forms can be terrible. So this is outside of Amsterdam. This is the neighborhood of Slotovart, um, which was built in the 1950s as sort of a utopian housing complex for working class people, based on the thinking at the time, which was that no working class, class person would ever want to live in the little, tiny little houses by the canal in the center of the city. They'd want to live way out of town in an apartment. Um, and almost from the beginning, uh, and it was built using the best principles of design at the time, big empty green spaces between the buildings, winding streets, big parkland separating the whole neighborhood from the city, uh, and strict zoning saying, industry shall be here, housing shall be here, and uh, shops shall be here, and they won't touch each other, and so on. These were the best principles at the time. Almost from the beginning, the people moving into this were not workers coming from the center of the city, but were immigrants coming from Morocco and Turkey to, to fill labor shortages. And this neighborhood was almost perfectly designed for failure for new immigrants. Everything about it was disastrous for them, because the things that new immigrants like to do when they start were very, very hard to do. You could not start a shop down here and sell something. Because first of all, there is no place for it. Second of all, because of the design of the neighborhood, no customer from the city was ever going to go there. It was very low population density, which meant that there were these frightening empty spaces between buildings that, that gangs and untrustworthy people hung out in that, that further lowered the property values. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it felt like it was very, very difficult to connect yourself in any way, socially, educationally, economically, to the actual city you lived in. It was easier to connect yourself via these satellite dishes to the country that you had come from. And this neighborhood spiraled downward over the years until it became the place in this, these blocks of buildings here where that young man came from who murdered Theo van Gogh, the filmmaker, and started this cycle of political reaction and extremism that has dominated Dutch politics for the last several years and continues to in many ways. What do you do about this? What do you do when a neighborhood like this becomes a parallel society, to use the expression and so on? And one of the principles of the arrival city I think we have to understand is to understand why it's failed, often you have to understand what made it an arrival city in the first place. Why was the, why was the property cost or the rental cost so much lower than other places in the city that a poor villager from somewhere could move into it? And sometimes it's because of physical limitations. Um, and usually that, and sometimes it's because of bureaucratic limitations. And so, sometimes the problems aren't because of the situation of the city, arrival city, but are because of citizenship policies that prevent people from doing things. And that's what makes the place a good bottom rung on the ladder, but prevents it from having the next two rungs. So you can get out of the impoverished place you come from and live there, but you can't make the next two steps up into urban life. What did they do in Slaughterbart was very interesting because they realized that, okay, well, our citizenship policies are okay, our business policies are, are okay, our education system needs some work, but we're working on it. But this neighborhood's physically impossible. And like many of the new immigrant neighborhoods, it's physically designated in a way that it could never succeed. So, so some of the housing cooperatives that run this demolished these buildings and replaced them with these. And what they said was, let's take a look at the arrival city neighborhoods that have worked really well. Lower East Side of New York City. It has sent about five different ethnic groups have gone through there, East European Jews, uh, Southern European Catholics, Irish Catholics, uh, uh, Central Americans, Greeks, have all moved through the Lower East Side, succeeding, becoming university educated, moving into the middle class. Usually it takes about three generations and so on, but it's, it's always worked. It looks like this. Lower Spadina Avenue in Toronto, where I come from, looks like this. Brick Lane, uh, uh, Spitalfields, Whitechapel in London, which has again sent multiple ethnic groups into integration, looks like this. Let's recreate that physical form in hope that the social form will follow it. Five to 15 story buildings with no green space in between, but nice little parkettes behind them, um, along very straight streets to allow a lot of car traffic so that customers will come to your shop, um, directly connected to the core of the city so you can get back and forth easily and so on. And with a mixture of, uh, of apartment housing on the top and, uh, and, and sh spaces below that could be industrial, retail, uh, uh, commercial, whatever you want, restaurants and so on, uh, any type of business you want to do, roughly. I mean, the Dutch are a little bit rigid about these things, but uh, 
uh, uh, essentially allowing people to have their soup within the neighborhood and so on, but also some spaces and even some apartments that are unaffordable to the poor immigrants coming in there deliberately in order to attract the yuppies, the hipsters, uh, and so on, who are an, an important part of the success of any of these places in ways that I won't get into in detail here, but making the schools work, making the, uh, the mixture of consumers and producers work and so on, making the political self-organization work. It helps to have a mix of classes, it helps to have a mix of cultures and so on. Now, I'm not arguing that clustering of people by ethnic group is a bad thing and should be eliminated. It should stay and it continues in places like this because people need to be mutually supporting each other, forming these networks of support uh, when they immigrate. But it helps to have the social structure. And in some other cities, they've done this in a way that's self-financing, because what they do, they realize that to improve a failed urban neighborhood like that, one of the things you need to do is increase the population density. High population density is good for social cohesion and integration and so on. So you're doubling the number of people who live in the space, and you make some of the apartments uh, for sale apartments, condominium apartments that you sell to middle class people. The sale of those apartments finances the whole redevelopment and then provides the social mix, the customers for the supermarkets and so on that do that. So there's a lot of innovative things happening in cities that can be used to turn around failed neighborhoods that don't necessarily exhaust a fiscal budget. It's none of it's free. It requires an investment. But I think one of the message, messages I'm trying to send is that, is that turning around failed uh, immigrant integration neighborhood does not require multiple generations of spending on welfare and that sort of thing. Uh, when I'm talking to conservative American audiences about this stuff, one of the th things I say to them is that this is not all about getting government in to do things. It's about getting government out of the way. They like to hear that. And uh, <laughs> getting, a, getting out of licensing and zoning and, and controlling how people do business. Allowing, allowing people to be a little bit messy and unhygienic and, and decide the shape of their own neighborhood and what, whether, what should be residential and industrial and so on. Um, and allowing some degrees of self-government and self-policing. The Moroccan immigrants here took up their own policing and they decided that one of the things they wanted was it for it to be much more strict than the Dutch model of policing. Uh, they didn't want their teenager sons dropping out of school at age 16. They wanted truancy patrols who would go around and find any teenager on the streets and drag him into a school and force him to go there and so on. And, um, and if you do surveys of, of immigrant communities about what they want in their community, urban planners are always horrified by the results because they don't say, we want a nice park or, or we want some you know, green spaces or something. Number one is almost always is security, which is a complicated word that needs to be unpacked somewhat, but it means a number of things, including policing, um, including a number of social things that have to do with anxieties about what happens to your daughters when you immigrate that are culturally complicated and so on. But, but so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean, and you have to be careful who you're listening to in a community and so on. Um, but uh, if there's a lesson in all this, it's, it's that some of the lessons from these slum neighborhoods I showed you in a small way could be applied to Western urban neighborhoods in a beneficial way. The allowing the form of housing to grow organically according to the needs of the people who live there. The regulation of business and so on. Uh, some things do not happen naturally. Schools do not work properly naturally. They need an intervention and so on. So on the other side of the coin, there are some things from the Western city that need to be applied to the developing world, of course. Education things, public transportation things, infrastructure things. Um, and so on. Uh, so in a way, it's to say that there, I'm saying that there are some universal principles of the arrival city. There's some universal economic and social structures that happen. When failure occurs, it's usually because something that's been placed in the way. And that we ought to learn lessons from both failed and revived arrival cities around the world to learn how to make this large-scale urbanization work in the favor of our cities for the improvement and betterment of our cities and our economic and social futures rather than to create future failures. Thank you very much. And, uh